Good afternoon. My name is John Palfrey, and uh, I'm so grateful that you all have come in from the amazing sunshine. Uh, this, you arrived for Commissioner Brill on one of the best days in Boston history. So the it's fact that we have fabulous. anybody inside at this moment yes. um, to talk is great. Um, and I do want to note that we are being uh, recorded but not webcast. So anything you say in the spirit of um, uh, individual privacy, just note that it will be recorded. And we'd love to have you on the record and using a mic and saying your name, but uh, it will be uh, put on the Berkman Center website and so forth and archived after this event. And we look forward to having other people play this afterwards. Um, so it's a great pleasure to welcome Commissioner Julie Brill here to the Harvard Law School. Um, this is going to be an informal conversation for about an hour. I've got a few questions I'd like to ask. I think she's got a few things she'd like to talk about, um, but let's have this be as informal and as uh, very much a conversation as uh, as we can. We've got some mics to hand around. We will try to chase you with mics so that it's well recorded when you do um, uh, bring up uh, materials um, for discussion. Uh, I think Commissioner Bill is probably well known to all of us in the room. Um, she was appointed in 2010 to a term that lasts wonderfully until 2016, which is great news for all of us. She is focused in her work um, on a series of issues, including consumer uh, uh, privacy, which we will talk about in particular today. Uh, she's had a career in the private sector of law. She's been a law teacher at a wonderful law school, not this one, a fabulous other one, um, and has worked in uh, two state attorney general offices in um, uh, senior uh, enforcement roles. So she's seen it from the federal perspective. She's seen it from the state perspective. She has done it from the private sector perspective and has taught it, which is pretty much the, the perfect, uh, perfect storm of uh, different approaches to this. Um, so maybe I'll just start with a very broad and general question to uh, set the table, and then we can go from there. If I read carefully the press releases and the kind of outputs of the USFTC, it seems to me that uh, consumer privacy must be one of the top priorities of the entire uh, agency right now, which is great news. Um, but I wonder if you might uh, sort of let us know if that's in fact true, and maybe situate that in the broader landscape of the agency's priorities and work and statutes and so forth, and how you see um, consumer privacy today and going forward? Is this a growth area for the agency, and um, how might we see it within the broader context of your work? Sure, sure. Well, first of all, thank you for having me oh, here. We're it's thrilled really great you to came. be here. Um, uh, I love coming to speak to law students and speaking to academics because you're the ones who are really thinking about the future and thinking about where we ought to be going with a lot of these issues that we're, we're dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis in terms of enforcement. So it's really wonderful to come out and reach out to you. So I do it a fair amount and I always, always really enjoy it. Um, the Federal Trade Commission is uh, a really interesting agency and a lot of people don't know what it is when I walk around um, my town, my little tiny town also in New England, um, and I tell people I work at the Federal Trade Commission, they think I work in international trade, you know, and they say, why can't you fix the X, Y, and Z trade problem with the Chinese or whatever, and I, no, no, no. Outsourcing, you're Outsourcing. certainly to blame, right? Right, it's all, right exactly. Um, it's, it's consumer protection and it's antitrust, and actually the agency was formed in uh, 1914. It was the brainchild of Louis Brandeis. Um, it came out of the uh, 1912 election where the trusts and monopolies were a big, big deal. It's sort of hard to believe that that would be a big issue in a presidential election, but it actually was. And um, when Woodrow Wilson won, he ran on the issue. It was one of his big, big, big platforms. He asked Louis Brandeis to come up with a mechanism, come up with a, an idea to help solve this issue. And, and he conceived the Federal Trade Commission. It's an independent commission, no more than, as with other independent commissions, no more than three commissioners from the same political party. So we're bipartisan, as you mentioned, once we are um, nominated by the president and confirmed by the Senate, the commissioners cannot be removed by the administration. You're good until 2016. We're good. I, I mean, I suppose there are some rules that would kick me out for something or another if I did it, but I don't know Fill what those are. Fill out the right are. forms about taking the government car and that yeah, kind of thing. Yeah, stuff You'll like that. Right, yeah. right, right. But, but otherwise, right, I'm not, we're not part of the administration. Um, uh, and we do, we, so we focus on both competition and consumer protection, and we're designed to have a broad mandate, a flexible mandate, and to be able to do lots of research studies and thinking about sort of big picture issues. So in many ways, privacy fits really well with that kind of, uh, of a mandate. But in addition to privacy, before we get in there, we do all sorts of things um, on the competition side. Uh, we 
uh, along with the U.S. Department of Justice, the Antitrust Division, we look at huge mergers. We look at small, relatively small mergers, but they have to hit a certain um, dollar or other other kinds of thresholds to be a federal concern. We look at anti-competitive practices in the high tech industry. We look at a lot of healthcare issues. So we're looking at a gamut of issues on the competition side. Um, and in the consumer protection side, we do a, also a ton of stuff, advertising substantiation, um, telemarketing, um, all sorts of last dime frauds, which were something that we really focused in on to try to deal with consumers who were struggling through the, the recession, um, the Great Recession, and, and coming out of it. You know, <coughs> the scam artists love to victimize people who've already been victimed, victimized. So they you know, say, well, you, you've lost your home. You're about to lose your home. We'll help you. We'll get you out of foreclosure, et cetera. And ends up the consumers you know, are often um, worse off than they were when they started with a product or service along those lines. So we dealt a lot with those issues. Um, we run the Do Not Call list, the, uh, what Dave Barry calls the most popular government program since the Elvis stamp. Um, very proud of that. Um, and so we do, a, we do a ton of things. We do, we do a ton of things. So privacy, though, really does, I think, fit right in the center of the wheelhouse of what we do because um, it's so, it brings together you know, the, the, the study work that we do. It brings together economics and competition. But it also, of course, is a big uh, consumer protection issue. So um, we do focus on privacy. And, and um, you know, we... For many years, we're focused, but you know, we could go through sort of the history of privacy in, in the country, but um, I'd say back in the 2000s, without going further back, but back in the 2000s, there was a big focus on data security. That was a big issue at the agency, and I think within the federal government, hello. Um, and we, we, we still do a lot of work around data security, data breaches, um, uh, issues like that. And I'd say that, um, we also have begun, probably over the last three or four years, uh, certainly within the last two years that I've been here, hello, um, look, we uh, uh, look at inappropriate use of consumers' information or use of consumers' information for purposes that, they, that were not disclosed or that vary from uh, the purposes that were disclosed. Um, and that really falls within privacy. And then, of course, we enforce some what I call sector-specific laws, things like COPPA, the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act, and I'm sure we'll, we'll talk get back about to that. that. Yeah. Absolutely. So we do, um, you know, we, we, we have a very broad mandate, and within privacy, it is something that we, that we have really taken seriously, and we're doing a lot of work around. Excellent. Well, it's clearly an important thing for our country Absolutely. and uh, others to focus on this. Um, so just following up on some of the things that have been the headlines coming out of the FTC <laughs> recently, Historically, some, we've seen enforcement actions against uh, kind of edgy players of various sorts that people haven't heard of. But in the past year, there have been landmark settlements, as far as I can tell, both with Facebook and with Google. Um, and I wonder if you might comment on that and if there's any kind of detail you can fill in about the nature of those settlements. Then I have a couple of kind of follow-up questions in particular about what Google and Facebook have been doing. But maybe sure. if you could just start with sure. those settlements. And we also have a settlement with Twitter. Yep. Uh, so maybe I'll talk about all three. Um, the, the, the Twitter settlement was really more of a data security settlement. They, Which is a couple of years ago, right? It, well, um, I want to say it, it, was, it was during my tenure as yep. a commissioner, and uh, next month will be my second anniversary. Okay. So it might have been maybe a year and a half ago. Um, so, but it, it might have been a little while ago. Um, with Twitter, that was more of a data security issue. Uh, they were um, uh, public tweets that folks thought were private were becoming public, and uh, uh, it was because of um, essentially uh, some hacking that had been done. So that was a settlement that we entered into with Twitter in order to try to get them to um, better uh, secure their their whole system, their ecosystem. But um, with respect to Facebook and Google, uh, those were two settlements that in many ways borrowed concepts that we have used in the data security realm, and we imported them into the privacy realm. And I'll explain what I mean by that when I get to the remedies that we, that we um, put in place. But with respect to Facebook, um, there were a, a number of concerns about, about what they had been doing starting in around 2009 with their privacy policy and changes in their privacy policy and information that um, advertisers and apps were able to obtain from users' accounts. 
so those that was kind of the nature of what we were focused on. You know, they had done uh, things like um, they said they wouldn't be sharing information with advertisers. This is Facebook, said they wouldn't share information with advertisers, but in fact, information did get shared with advertisers. They said that um, they would take down photos on a user's own page, but then photos didn't get taken down or didn't get taken down you know, permanently. They, they started to reappear on the user's own page. Um, they also actually, interestingly enough, with respect to Facebook, we also dealt with the EU US safe harbor. Um, I don't know if we're going to talk about that uh, later on, but um, there's a, a regime in place to allow US companies to transfer data over to, um, to Europe, and uh, it's called a safe harbor regime. In any event, um, Facebook had said it was compliant with the, the EU US safe harbor, but in fact, um, wasn't. So there were a number of issues that we were looking at with respect to Facebook. And um, what we essentially required them to do, in addition to stop doing the particular things that we had concerns about, we, we, we took this concept that we had used in the data security realm, which was if someone had um, not kept data secure and we entered into a settlement with them, we said to that company, you're going to have to implement a data security program and for 20 years, you're going to have to have it monitored through an independent auditor. Um, and we required Facebook to do the same thing with respect to a privacy program. So it wasn't a data security program. It was a privacy program. We said that Facebook would have to implement for 20 years a program where they'd have to um, have a, a, a full-blown privacy program, full-blown data management program with respect to privacy that would be independently audited for 20 years. Um, and uh, we also um, said that to the extent that they're going to be using Facebook, to the extent that Facebook would be using consumers' information in a way that hadn't been previously disclosed or that consumers hadn't previously agreed to, Facebook would need to obtain affirmative express consent from the user. So those were probably the two biggest pieces of the Facebook settlement. Um, Google's, Google was actually pretty similar. Um, in the Google settlement, uh, um, I don't know how many of you remember Google Buzz. Remember when that was launched? That was Google's first social media um, effort, which we no longer have Google Buzz. So it didn't, it didn't really, it was, it was their beta version, I guess. And um, one of the things, a number of things happened around that that some of you may remember. Uh, consumers were sort of suddenly in Google Buzz. They hadn't opted in. It just sort of came about that all their information, if they were a Gmail user or whatever, they were in Google Buzz. Although Google disputes a fair amount of these they, facts, right? Well, um... Anyway, keep going, but we can come back to Does Google... Um, Go uh, if I'm remembering correctly, yeah. Google uh, did not admit or deny our allegations. Yep. Um, Same thing in the civil settlement for their, uh, their the class action lawsuit. Uh, anyway, could yeah. very well be. Could very well be. And, it, and the same would be true with Facebook. You know, we, these are allegations that we have made, yep. and we would have made if it had gone to court, but they agreed to settle. So, um, uh, but with respect to consumers being swept into it without first opting in, I don't know whether Google would dispute that. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm not sure. What they might dispute is whether or not consumers had the tools to get out of it. One of the things that we alleged was it was hard for consumers to get out of it. That might be something that, mm -hmm. that they would um, not necessarily admit. Um, another issue that we had concerns about were um, consumers' most, frequently use, most frequent email partners became public. And this was a big concern, and we heard about this from a lot of um, users, people like doctors who were emailing patients, or maybe um, people who were employed but looking for new jobs, right? And so they were emailing people, and then somehow this information about who their most frequent email partners were became public. So that was a concern mm -hmm. of ours. Um, essentially, Google agreed to the same types of provisions that we had put in place with respect to Facebook. In fact, actually, the Google settlement, if I'm remembering correctly, was first, and then came Facebook. But it was the same thing. Can't use consumers' information in a way that consumers hadn't been told about and hadn't agreed to without affirmative express consent going forward, and also a 20-year program of, of of where they had to have a privacy, a full-blown privacy program with an independent auditor. Um, so those were two those are two pretty significant um, settlements. And I, if I'm remembering correctly, um, the Google one ha it has been finalized. The Facebook one is still open for public comment. 
So I see a lot of Apple users in the room. How many people are using Safari here? Not very many, actually. A handful of Safaris. But yeah. um, since your agreement, there's been further yes. revelations, right, about Google and Safari. Yes. And yes. if I understand the, at least the allegations yes. correct, um, the, the idea was that Google was collecting some information about Safari users in a way that wasn't, um, didn't make Apple happy, didn't make the consumers happy, may or may not have made the USFTC happy, particularly given the fact that these two agreements now have long tails, right, that they have to, they um, they have to uh, confirm. So I wonder, are you going to be pressing Google to figure out whether or not they, in fact, linked up Safari data with the Google accounts and so forth? And how, how would something, I mean, you could speculate on that one, but other things that one could imagine will happen in the next 20 years, how will the fact that they have this agreement with you which is a settlement, is it a consent decree technically? It's, it's a consent order, Consent yes. order, right. Yes. So they're a operating under a consent order. Yes. How will it affect something like the Safari revelation? So I, um, it's a very fair question, and I don't blame you for asking the question at Good, all. Good, I'm glad. Um, I can't answer with respect to Apple and the yeah. Safari issue. Um, uh, but so let me let me just take a step back and, and more generally say that um, now that uh, both Google and Facebook, and for that matter, Twitter, are under order. Um, in the event that they violate those orders, they're subject to penalties now. And the penalties amount to you know $16,000 per violation, which one could argue is per person, one could argue it's per day. There's all sorts of calculations about how that's done. But um, you know, we, we take their obligations very seriously yeah. under, under an order. And we believe they take their obligations yep. very seriously under an order. So I wish I could answer, you know, that so particular question. Maybe, just maybe just it. for a from a student perspective. Sure. If one were trying to understand how the FTC, when it's got a big company under a consent order, and something that one might think of as bad happens, right. what happens behind the scenes of the FTC, FTC to determine how to react to this? Is it a staff lawyer is sort of trying to think this through and then comes to you as a commissioner and then yep. brings it to the commission. Like, what's the process? So that's a great question. So we have a division of um, privacy and information practices. We call it DPIP. They're great people. They're run by great, um, great attorneys who are very, very dedicated to data security and privacy issues. And knowing, as they do, that um, uh, you know, a company is under order when they hear about something you know, like the things you were talking about or other things that could be a violation of the order, typically speaking, the first step will be to call the company in mm -hmm. and say, what's going on here? Actually, that may not be the first step. The first step might be to ask technologists, given the, given the types of issues we're talking about, but to ask someone who might be an expert in the field, what's going on? Say Ed Felton? Oh, just say Ed Felton, okay. right? <laughs> who we happen to now have on staff. Ed Felton is absolutely wonderful. R run, ran, he's on a sabbatical from Princeton's program. He's absolutely wonderful. Someone like that to sort of say, okay, the New York Times ran this article, the Wall Street Journal ran this article. What's going on? Is, and does this look like something that we should be concerned about? So we do some independent information gathering on our own, and then we will call the company in and we'll say, okay, what's going on? You've got this obligation. We think you may be doing X, Y, and Z that may be in violation. Tell us what's happening. And um, you know, it depends on what the issue is. If it's a technology issue, we may end up um, interviewing the people who wrote the code, the people who, are, who, who were responsible for the issue. If it's a dot, more of a document issue, we'll review documents. So it's almost like we, we're, we're taking, bringing a case over again. We're investigating a case anew, but the penalties are different, and the, 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 if, if they are found to have violated the order, it could be a very serious issue. Mm -hmm. So, and then what happens? After it's investigated, the staff determines whether or not they want to make a recommendation, and then they bring a recommendation up to the commissioners, and the commissioners decide mm -hmm. whether we're going to agree that there was a violation or not, or that there wasn't a violation. Maybe I'll further channel the law professor in you, sure. since we're talking about uh, law enforcement in a law school classroom. Uh, what are, what's the range of remedies that you could bring? Can you bring some, I mean, obviously you can bring a lot of fines, and you obviously can um, make some orders. Can you enjoin them from doing things? Yes. Yes, we can enjoin them. We can um, assess fines if, uh, under certain circumstances, we don't have general civil money penalty authority. Um, but in certain circumstances, like an order violation or a rule violation, we can ob obtain penalties. Um, we can uh, obtain um, restitution for consumers, which can be fairly significant. We can obtain disgorgement in appropriate cases. 
um, meaning that whatever their ill-gotten gains were, we could require the company to, to give that back. Um, injunctive relief, as you said, and and like the kinds of things that we were t I was talking about, you know, having to create a privacy program, a comprehensive privacy program that's going to be monitored for 20 years. That's injunctive relief. That's trying to look forward to see how we can make sure that the problem doesn't happen again. So we can do all of that, and we of course can tell them you, you can't violate that area of the law mm -hmm. anymore. So if I might, I'm going to pick up on your COPPA reference, the sure. Children's Online sure. Privacy Protection Act. Um, and I see my good friend and colleague Dana Boyd sitting here in Absolutely. the first row, which is great. And, and my friend too. <laughs> our, our friend, yes. Dana Boyd. Um, and Dana led a study that I and others worked on as well recently that looked at um, a national survey set of uh, parents in particular, and looked in the context of rethinking COPPA at rates of compliance with COPPA. And I know that you've read the study and you actually disagree in some respects with our findings and agree in part. So I wonder if you might talk generally about how you're thinking about COPPA and whether or not sure. um, the, these kinds of data that have been coming out about the extent to which um, uh, people don't always comply with this law, how, how to think about that in the context of, uh, of your authority. Uh, does it, would it make sense, I mean, I don't know if everybody in the room knows what COPPA is. Should I take a step back and sort of just explain it a little bit? I'm seeing a couple of people nod. Um, is that okay? That's great, just, yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and I, I will not avoid the question because I think it's good. a great question. That's good, and then I'll, I'm going to get a mic over to Dana in the meantime. Oh, good. She, she may excellent. talk about our findings excellent. better than excellent. I will. Excellent, excellent. So, you're the on Children's that. Online Protection Act is known as COPPA. Um, it was enacted by Congress in 19, I want to say 98. One of the laws that passed through Congress incredibly quickly because it deals with children and it dealt with issues around uh, privacy and data security. And actually, ultimately, some of the arguments about COPPA were security of the, of the children themselves um, because information about children and what they're doing online, there were concerns that that could actually affect the safety of children. So it passed through Congress very, very quickly. Um, what it, uh, the, it, it, its goals were, um, and uh, we'll have an interesting discussion about this, but I think it's fair to say that Congress's goals in enacting COPPA were to enhance parental involvement with respect to their children's activities online. Uh, to protect children's safety, as I mentioned, um, and to maintain the, the safety when they visit and post information online, and also the security of their information. Um, and then uh, probably the fourth issue that the Congress was thinking about was to limit online collection of personal information about children. Now, COPPA defines children as um, kids under 13. So once you hit 13 under the COPPA regime, you're no longer a child. Uh, and, the, and we actually, um, the Federal Trade Commission was given authority to enact a rule or, or promulgate a rule to implement COPPA and we sort of filled out what, what, what the compliance regime for the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act would be through this rule. Um, so, so basically between the law and the rule, what uh, online operators have to do is first they have to figure out do they come under the Children's Online, Prote Online Privacy Protection Act. And they come under it if they are directing their online um, offering, services, whatever, uh, to children under 13. Or if they know that the person that is on their website or service or whatever is under 13. So it's either directed at kids or that they have knowledge that the um, uh, the, the person is, is a child. And if they fall into either of those categories, then uh, the, the operator, the, web, the website or mobile app or whatever operator, has to provide notice to a parent that, um, you know, what their information collection practices are, and they have to get permission from the parent to allow the child on the site. Um, and the, the term that's used in the, in the rule, in this, I think it's in the rule, not the statute, is they have to obtain verifiable parental consent before they can begin to collect information about, about the child. So um, we're actually in the process of reviewing our, the rule. Um, we had last reviewed the rule in 2005. And we, at, in 2005, decided we weren't going to um, change anything, that everything sort of seemed the same. 
Um, normally we review rules every 10 years, but we decided to accelerate this one. And when you think about it, I mean, if you sit back and think about it, uh, Tom Friedman had a great line that I heard on a podcast. He, he, you know, when you compare 2005 to 2012, right, what was 4G? It was a parking space, right? What was, what was Skype? It was a typo, right? An app, an application was like those of us who are parents in the room, right? We were working to get our kids to send them into college, right? The app meant nothing other than that. I mean, and Twitter, what was Twitter? It was a sound, right? The world has changed drastically. I mean, if you go back to 2005, none of these things actually existed. Or if they existed, they were very, very like nascent. Um, not, not anywhere um, uh, as, pen they haven't, didn't penetrate nearly as, as much as they have by now. So we just decided, look, in this new technological world where kids are spending so much time online and they're doing so much in terms of um, apps and, and getting so much information and, and educational value and, every, and communicating with each other and all the great stuff the kids are doing online, we needed to look at COPPA and update it. And one of the things that we are in particular looking at is what is personal information? Um, because uh, under, co under the current regime, for instance, geolocation information wasn't necessarily considered personal information. But now, you know, it, with a cell phone that a kid, or a smartphone that a kid might have, someone could actually track a kid all through the day. And it might not have the kid's name attached to that, to that um, geolocation information, but the UDID for the, for the cell phone would be attached to that information. And essentially that means that you are getting the entire sort of location of a, of a child through the day, through the week, through the month. And so we thought it was really important to bring up to date, you know, what, what the personal information, um, what personal information would be considered, uh, or what information would be considered personal under COPPA. So those are the kinds of things that we decided, look, we, we really need to update it. So that's, that's, that's the background. A background. That's so, a background so let me, on what COP is. Let me then turn over to yeah. Dana, if I might, and say I think some of us uh, would suggest that more than tweaking is necessary for this regime. And I think one of the data sets one might rely on is the one that Dana had the lead in, in, uh, in pulling together. So I don't know if you want to talk a little about the study and your you know, broader concerns. I want to do a little bit more of a context, which is that um, since that ruling came out, the way that many companies implemented it uh, or de dealt with it, or by not dealing with it, was to say that uh, you had to be 13 or older right. to be on the site. And most of you have seen this little check mark or various things that require you to put your birthday in, that you're over the age of 13. This is absolutely commonplace in, this, in major social media communication services like you know, Hotmail, Gmail, um, Skype, AIM, etc. It's also really common in the social network sites, Facebook, MySpace, etc. I've been doing ethnographic work for an extended period of time at this point, and kept noticing these amazing comments from parents and kids about how it was ridiculous that you know, these companies were forbidding children from getting access to these communication technologies, to these social media technologies. And parents wanted their kids to have access to it. And I was like, wow, you don't know what's going on here at all. And you know, I sort of I, I drilled into it, and, and I realized over and over again that I was hearing this expectation that this was about um, some sort of maturity rating or different kinds of things. So, you know, I was struggling with this, and I was struggling with it qualitatively. So I realized, and I started sort of talking with people about what I was seeing, and people were like, oh, that's just qualitative data. You, you don't know what you're talking about. That's not actually what's happening nationally. So uh, part of it is, is that I pulled in a team of folk, um, which is this paper was written by uh, myself, Esther Hargitay, um, John, and Jason Schultz. And the idea was that we had four different perspectives and four different analytic tool sets to go with. And we um, also tag team with a group of about 27 different quantitative scholars to try to make as rigorous as possible a survey at a national level of parents to get at different aspects of what was going on. And for this particular paper, we only released a mere fraction of the data that we collected. And in this paper, we looked particularly at Facebook because Facebook is like the most contested of them. Although in many ways, the numbers are actually higher for um, uh, communication services than they are for Facebook. And what we found was kind of astonishing, which is that of uh, parents who have 12-year-olds in the US, and this is nationally representative sample of parents, you know, we can go through the sort of methodology of it, but of parents who have 12-year-olds, 12, 55% 12 of them allow their child on to Facebook, 
right? And what was even more astonishing to them is how many of them knew, and this was highest for Facebook compared to other things, but how many of them absolutely knew that their child was lying about the age, right? And so it was not even just a matter of, so with, with interestingly, with email, parents tended to not know there was an age limitation. With MySpace, which was actually the highest, um, and Facebook also, parents knew there was an age limitation, but thought that it was not appropriate for uh, thought it was appropriate for their child to be on in violation of the age restriction. And so we sort of drilled down in the survey more deeply and found that, um, first off, parents had absolutely no uh, clue what was going on, what this, what these, what the, where the age restriction came from. But they also, I mean, also mind you, they also have no clue about different kinds of privacy related bits. So one of the other things that was in the study was we asked them, um, you know, uh, how, how upset would it make them, and I forget the exact wording of it, uh, that um, privacy or private data about their child would be collected. And they were like, oh, it's absolutely bad. We, you know, we, we think this is bad. We asked, them, well, how likely is this to be occurring? Oh, it never occurs. It's like, uh, okay. So there's a lot of misunderstanding that came on. So part of it was just laying out some of the first level data of saying, Parents, in many ways, are struggling with this. They don't understand it. The ability to use this as a tool to get parents involved has actually turned into a really weird involvement of getting parents involved in helping their kids lie about their age. Because, oh, another key point is that not only did they know their kids right. violated it in terms of age, they often helped them do so, mm -hmm. um, which was another big trigger of it. So they helped their kids lie about their age. Um, which is an interesting finding. So since we put this out, we've also had some really interesting feedback because one of the other things um, that, uh, if those who don't know, this is a requirement for commercial websites. This is not a requirement for um, nonprofit websites. That said, overwhelmingly, nonprofit websites are repeating this type of dynamic as well. So one of the things that we started to find was how many libraries in the United States are actually repeating the 13 limitation as well. And we actually triggered on it with the Boston Public Library here. And we said, so why? And they're like, well, we have to apply by COPPA. And, uh, and so we literally sent them the rule and said, nope, you don't actually have to apply. Well, we feel like we should. <laughs> it was like, oh. So we're seeing this become a kind of rhetoric. And it's amazing to see that, that misunderstanding of the rule. So part of it was trying to actually collect some data and say, well, I think that the intentions both of, the, um, of Congress and of the FTC in implementing this were completely well-founded and reasonable. The way that it has played out has not actually lived up to the expectations, and therefore the ideas of extending it, uh, in many ways what we argued is that extending it, going further into it, further re-implements something that in many ways is broken and we have to actually step back and question the beginning. So that's kind of where we came at that project from. And you know, if anybody, anybody is a statistician and wants to have a field day with data, I have so much more data on this for a whole set of other factors that I just haven't had time to process. It's up on first Monday. It was peer reviewed and it's open access. Yeah. And this is, by the way, I will say one of the best ways of dealing with these things is get every statistician geek that you know to just jam on every process with you. And we, we had an amazing time just trying to get this as rigorous as possible. Um, we still got slammed in different ways, but it was really a fascinating process. And we got partially slammed by the United States FTC well, Commissioner Julie Bill. Well, I was Bill, actually going to say you didn't get, I don't think you got slammed you know, by me. What yeah. I, so I, so let me say that I thought the data was great. I, I, I thought the, the data was fascinating. Um, and look, I read, I read the piece. I we're read incredibly it. grateful. I you read, actually I, read it even unprompted. You went, you went. And absolutely found it. no. I had read it before you guys, before um, uh, these nice people came in and visited me in Washington, and were you know because I was uh, talking about the study, and and I had read it you know before you ever came in. I no, I thought it was a great study. I thought the data was really important. I think where we differ is the conclusions that one would draw from the data. And um, some of the key findings for me in the data were, uh, as, as, as Dana mentioned, that parents helped their kids uh, lie about their age to get onto Facebook. Uh, just to use a personal, personal story, um, when my younger son finally friended me um, on Facebook, uh, I sort of then saw his, you know, data, his his information, and I thought, well, wait, is this the right Noah Miller? Because this kid's much older than my kid. <laughs> so he figured it out all on his own, right? He got his own birth date in the place that it needed to be in order to get on. Um, 
But my sister, who has twin girls, uh, who are now 13, um, but about a year, maybe a year to nine months ago, she helped them get on Facebook. She said, you know, they're, all their friends are on. That's where all the communication's going. It's exactly, Dana, what you talk about, that this has become the social square, the mall, the whatever that, that older people who are older used to use in order to communicate with their friends. It's now all happening online. And that's a, that's a great thing, and that's a parent choice, a parental choice. And so my sister, like many, 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 I forget the, st the stats, but I think maybe it was 70% of the parents helped their kids get online of those who were 76. on. Yeah, okay. I was pretty close, though. I mean, for, for not having written it. Um, uh, so, you know, a large number of these parents did help their kids actually um, uh, fib about their age in order to participate in Facebook. So what, did this, what this said to me wasn't that we needed to rethink COPPA and the requirements about protecting kids. Because what it said to me was actually that, I, I, that parents want to participate in these decisions. They want to know where their kids are online, and they want to be a part of the conversation with their kids. And I think that's the tool that COPPA gives them. And you know, when I think, as I'm, I'm a law enforcement person, right? I'm, I'm not an academic. I mean, as, as much as I love academics, I'm not one. And I sort of have to think about, well, what would the world be like if there weren't a COPPA? And, and, and that's where I start, I start to get worried. Um, so so I, I, you know, one of the conclusions that you all drew in the paper, which I thought was a very valid one, it was, you know, why, do we, why are we only protecting kids under 13? What about 13 and 14 year olds? What about 15 and 16 year olds? What about 65 year olds? You know, there are a lot of different folks who need protection with respect to their information. And if I'm recalling right, I think one of the things that you called for was baseline privacy legislation rather than focusing on kids. Now, maybe we'll get to this soon, but you know, the, the administration has called for baseline privacy legislation. That's, been, that's part of the Privacy Bill of Rights and the effort that the administration is, is going to be pushing. I have called for baseline privacy legislation. I think it's a great idea, but until that gets put in place, I don't want to see COPPA removed because I, because I really want to continue to empower parents to be part of this conversation for their kids. So I wouldn't say I've slammed you, um, but I would say that I, I, I think it's great work that you all did, and I, I, I love the data. I think it's very important to look at, to, to understand what parents are thinking. But I think what we need to think about as policymakers is what's the conclusion mm -hmm. one should draw from it. Can I follow on? Can yeah. I add to this? Um, of course. So, one of the, so when we did this paper, we decided purposefully to go after and sort of see dynamics around parents. But I also did a lot of qualitative work following up on it, trying to see some of the dynamics, in particular, around the idea that they're, like, what do we think about parents' roles in this? Yeah. And you know, one of the things, um, uh, Gaia Bernstein has done an amazing analysis of legal statute uh, for the last, I think it's 20 years, about how it fits into certain norms of middle upper class parenting. And this is one of the things that I think that we've seen, we even see within our data that we haven't properly released yet, um, which is that this is very much about certain class dynamics. And one of my current projects right now is trying to look at different dynamics where things around parents aren't always so pleasant. And one of the most, for those who don't know about my human trafficking work right now, but one of the most heartbreaking things that you see in um, commercial sexual exploitation of children is how often, um, and this is about domestic sides, so this is the US, how often kids who get involved in commercial sexual exploitation, um, I, I, kid prostitutes, are in many ways either running away from parents or sold into slavery by parents, um, which is one of the, like that's actually at the extreme end of horrible. Uh, but one of the things that we really struggle with is what are the more moderate end of horrible, where parents always aren't always good actors. And I think this is one of the things I struggle with in this data, as, but since I spend so much time in communities where things aren't always great, which is I think that in very privileged environments, we think about empowering parents and we think about all of those great parents, like all of you in the room who really care about your kids, are super involved and super engaged and want to do the right thing. But I think the big challenge I throw back to you is, is how do we make certain that our statutes protect young people whose parents aren't always good actors 
who need certain privacy protections, which is really important, but who, for whom we don't necessarily want abusive parents to be ones coming in and controlling this. And that's where, like, when I started to look at the data on LGBT ac access, when I started looking at the data about kids and eating disorders and disordered eating and self-injury start happening at 10, 11, 12 in really problematic households, this is where I'm starting to get worried. And so I, I'm, in some ways, I think that the that COPPA does a great job by middle upper class kids. And I'm like, gung ho, let's go for it. Well, I worry about kids who, even from middle upper class households whose parents are not in the best place to be dealing with this, but also for whom it, there does need to be a class inflection where things are not always as great. So from one of the questions is how do you deal with that where parents aren't always the good people? It's a great question. I, I, I don't have an answer. It's a great question. I mean, I'm not, I'm, you know, I think about, I'm going to use, use some analogies. You know, the nutrition labels that Congress enacted under the NLEA, the Nutritional Labeling and Education Act, lots of studies have been done about who actually reads those nutrition labels. It's people like me, you know, <laughs> white, white middle class women are the people who read the nutrition labels. And those whose job it is to read regular well, anyway. Right, right, right. But we'll leave, we'll leave those <laughs> folks aside. But that, you know, the, the new laws. Some people read privacy policies, probably. Oh, well, we can, we can talk about that, that, that population, too, or subpopulation, too, for sure. But, you know, it, it, is, it is absolutely true that, um, you know, some laws that are very, very well-intentioned and, and do have a good impact for a large sector or some, some size of the population might not have an effect. You're actually positing that they may have a negative impact on other sectors. And um, maybe the answer is baseline privacy legislation. I mean, I really don't know. I, I, I'm not sure I, I think we should do away with COPPA to deal with that issue. But I hear your issue loud and clear. And I, I don't have an answer to it. I think it's a great point. I don't have an answer to it. And again, I wouldn't want to do with nutritional labeling. There's been, there's been studies that have been done about, you know, the, um, the new laws are now requiring restaurants that are uh, chains of, of greater than a certain size to have uh, calorie information. Especially that New York law. If you well, it, it comes from New York, and it comes from um, some of the cities in California, but it's going to be implemented nationally. There have been some studies about who looks at that information and who gets it. And again, it's my demographic who looks at it, and so I might not buy a Starbucks uh, venti chai when I see how many calories it really is. But there are other groups of, of uh, the population that look at it and may not understand what a calorie is, and so they see the high number and they think that that's better. It's energy. It's worse. <laughs> actually, it is. And, or, or they think, oh, you know, I don't care. They're telling me this is bad, and they actually engage in sort of um, counterintuitive behavior. What, what some would say is counterintuitive behavior, they actually do it very intentionally. So that's another example. And, and this is just one study I've heard about with respect to that. It's just an example of, you know, we try to do the best we can as policymakers. We try to address a problem. Other problems arise that also do need to be addressed, but I'm not sure that means you want to do away with the first solution. But I think the difference there is that, in some ways, we're dealing with an information, and in other ways, we're talking about a direct expectation of power. I, I, I understand. I do. I, I'm not, I'm, I'm, again, it's not a perfect analogy. It's just. Um, yeah. it's, it, it, I think it, it does. Uh, They're both carry instances of potential. Right. Unintended consequences from well-intended laws, right? That's at least well, one and, way. Well, and also that. That, the, that the laws are not only well-intended, but actually do have a very good effect for a lot of people. But for some, they don't. That's the point I think that you're making. Yeah. So I have several other questions I want. I also have a couple that I've channeled from the Twitter sphere sure. and, and email. But I want to see if any others in the room want to bring anything up. I've, I've monopolized so far. And if you're willing to say who you are on the record, that'd be great, but you don't <laughs> have to. I'm Adam Tanner, a Neiman Fellow here at Harvard. In, in general terms, if you look a couple years forward, do you think with, as, as data is aggregated, there's more personal information, will, will Americans be more accepting that they're gonna be, there's going to be less privacy for the convenience of all the internet stuff, or do you think there will be a greater demand for more privacy, a greater move towards, say, European or, or different styles of, of, of standards? What do you see happening on that? So I, um, that's a great question. Um, you know, and I, um, uh, I don't have a crystal ball for sure. And I, you know, n nobody does. And probably everybody here in this room, we've got a lot of big brain power here in this room. Probably you could poll just this room and you'd get, you know, as many opinions as you do have people here. 
But I think what I would say is based on my experience working at the state level for many, many years with respect to data breach notifications, it always, you know, companies, businesses said data breach notifications are really a bad idea because consumers will be lulled into not worrying about data security. They'll get notice after notice and they'll just become complacent. My experience was actually the exact opposite, that as consumers got more notices, the issue rose in their, in their minds and they became more and more concerned. Not, there wasn't a complacency, there wasn't sort of a, an effect that said, oh, well, just another data breach, you know, I'll go on my way. I think I sense a similar phenomenon with respect to privacy and with respect to, for instance, let's just talk about a big company that may have a search engine and maybe has an ad network and maybe decided to change its privacy policies recently. And, you know, I didn't see the public lie back and say, there's, you know, this is all okay. I heard a lot of outcry about it. I actually think that what will happen is there'll be more and more awareness on the part of consumers about this issue. Now, again, I'm just, I, 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 you know, I know about the future as much as we all know, which is um, nothing. But I do um, uh, think past is prologue. And I do think that there is um, a lesson that can be learned with respect to data breach notifications that can apply in the privacy context. Very helpful. So uh, up here on the far right is Professor Jonathan Zittron. Okay. Just so you know, yes. he is, I think, the first and only person in Harvard history to be appointed to three faculties, the wow. Kennedy School, which is the policy school, of course, School of Engineering and Applied Sciences, and this very same Harvard Law School. Cool. So that's a triple threat could be coming your I'm way. I, I, I'm ready for it. I'm yeah, ready. Yeah, yeah. I'm in negotiations with the dental school. Right? <laughs> <laughs> That would ensure that it's not just past I don't but future. I don't want to too soon, but it's looking good. Well, I'm honored you're here, and it's wonderful to meet you, and maybe we can chat afterwards. Yes. Okay. So I imagine preparations are now completely underway for the 100th anniversary centennial of yes. the Federal Trade Commission. That's going to be a blowout of a party. Blowout of a party. Yeah, you're all invited. Exactly. You're all invited. You've been squirreling away all those fines for a special occasion. They go to the, they go to the Treasury. Yeah. They go It'll to be the Treasury. bicentennial of the Harvard Law School in a scant five years. Just so is you that know. right? Yep, 2017. Wow. Wow. All right. We shall be ready. Planning is underway for that. Yes. Um, so. Looking back, right, 100 years, there's going to be all sorts of ways in which people will think about the nature of its humble beginnings, how far it has come, how well it's been able to do what it's done. And of course, some of it is built into flexibility. When I teach torts, we talk about rules versus standards mm -hmm. and the ways in which there's a big difference between trying to articulate exactly what somebody can and can't do, and then sure. as soon as circumstances change, loopholes appear. And standards, which says, you know, go out and be excellent or don't be negligent. Or don't be unfair and deceptive. Correct. And of course, Federal Trade Commission immediately jumps to mind as, you know, anchoring the side of the field that is the standard. That has all sorts of drawbacks, too, which is why there's always a tension between the two approaches. So I'm curious about your thoughts on how the rest of the ecosystem of trying to deal with unfair and deceptive trade practices has developed around the FTC, and even if there are sort of implicit ways in which cooperation arises. I imagine, if I'm a Google, one reason why an FTC investigation is going to be of great moment to me will not only just be the PR hit I take if there's some fine, even if it's $10, but the class action suits that might follow and be drawing upon the documents that get released or the admissions that get made in the context of the FTC. Or maybe it's the other way around. The FTC can come in on the wake of a class action suit and have a lot of the work already sort of done and maybe then come in. So I'm, I'm curious about how well you figure the vision of Brandeis is still operable today mm -hmm. and the unique mm -hmm. position of a standards-based insular from the political establishment, but intended to be highly responsive to stakeholders, people lodge these complaints and such, how well that's still working and what you might change about it in today's globalized, technological, right. multi-jurisdictional world? Right, it's a great, that's a great question. We could spend a lot of time talking about that. Um, my personal view 
um, as one of five current, well, actually one of four current commissioners, we only have four um, right now, um, is that the standard approach, as you've defined it, rules versus standard, the standard approach is actually a wonderful tool. The flexibility is um, very, very helpful, especially when what the, the tool is unfairness and deception or un, uh, unfair methods of competition. I mean, th these are very broad terms. It'd be really interesting to see, um, well, actually, we did see Congress enact another law like that very recently, but it had been many, many years since they had, which was the Dodd-Frank law, right? It uses unfair, deceptive, and abusive. So actually added another term in. But I find um, having a standard that is flexible, can be applied in many different circumstances to, to really be, be quite helpful. And you know where the best example is about the dichotomy between, I'll get to class actions in a second, but I think that's sort of a side issue more than anything. The, um, the, uh, the dichotomy between rules and standards, as you've defined them, uh, really shows up in terms of the US privacy regime and the European privacy regime. And we, the federal, we at the Federal Trade Commission, we deal with our European counterparts a tremendous amount. Um, we're the um, US entity that is uh, uh, admitted to the, um, co the International Conference of data, data Privacy and Data Protection Commissioners, which is the international group that deals with this issue. Um, and you know, in Europe, they're much more accustomed to, I think, what you would define as a rule regimen. And uh, um, the Europeans have not yet deemed the United States to be adequate under the European regimen such that information can flow freely um, between US companies and European companies. Instead, they, we've created a safe harbor program, somewhat cumbersome for companies to operate under where they have to promise that they'll abide by certain rules and whatever, et cetera, et cetera, in order um, for, for instance, a US company to transfer data to Europe or vice versa, for a company from Europe to transfer data to the United States. Because we've not been deemed adequate. Because if you look at our laws, it just says unfair and deceptive acts and practices shall not be allowed. Or we have a sector specific law with respect to COPPA and kids. Or we have HIPAA, a health insurance law, sector specific. Or we have GLB, Graham Leach Bliley. Sorry if I'm going too fast, you know, but again, a sector. FERPA, since we're here, right? What? FERPA? FERPA. Yeah. FERPA. We don't, we don't enforce FERPA. Yeah, I think that's the Department of Ed. But yes, exactly, FERPA. Um, so we have sector specific laws, but we don't have an overarching uh, uh, rule based privacy law, at least at this time. So Europe doesn't deem us to be adequate. But here in the, in the US, we take the view, and I take the view, that the Federal Trade Commission actually does a really good job protecting privacy because what we do is we take our uh, standard, as, as, as you talked about, and we apply it in really what we call the common law of privacy. We've created a common law of privacy through all of the enforcement actions that we do. And we're very careful about cases we select. We are, you know, compared to a state AG's office, we have, we're very well resourced, but compared to other um, agencies in the federal government, we're, we're actually pretty small. So we call ourselves a small but mighty, fe you know, federal agency. But we, you know, we have to be careful about the, our resources. We have to be very careful about our case selection. So we pick cases that we feel um, communicate important information to industry. And there is a cadre of, of chief privacy officers, of privacy professionals, of people who are interested in this issue, who work for companies, who follow what we do very, very carefully. They have their own industry association They now. do, yeah. which is growing by leaps yeah. and bounds. I was just speaking there. They follow my every word very carefully. You I'm know? sure they're watching this video <laughs> they're, they're right now. They're watching this video right now. Well, what did she say? When did she raise her eyebrow? And you know, Zitrain asked that what did, question. What did, what did Zitrain mean when he asked that question exactly? Um, so we, we're not teasing those privacy professionals. No, not at all. I actually, when, when I speak to them, and I did just a couple of weeks ago, I applaud their organization. I applaud the fact that they care so deeply about what we do because they're the ones who are on the front lines of implementing privacy in the commercial, commercial sphere. And it's very important that they do listen to us. So I, I'm very, very supportive of, uh, of them and I speak to them all the time. But to get back to your question, so I, I see it really as a common law that's been developed here in the United States by having that 
general standard, which is a strong standard, and then applying it in specific cases. You know, we've only talked about a couple, but we've done many, many cases involving mobile apps, involving COPPA we've enforced, you know, so we've uh, involving behavioral advertising. And each of these cases, I think, sends an important message to the industry as a whole. Now, um, what, d d you know, one could, one could look at whether the Europeans do, do similar enforcement or do they rely on their rule-based mechanism and, and engage in a different kind of dialogue, if you will, with industry. But I, so that's where I come at. Um, but it's, you know, but I'm a law enforcement person. And so I, I like the flexibility of a, of a general standard that allows me to look at a new situation. As you said, when you have a rule, you can't always contemplate everything that's going to come up, and then you have to go write another rule. Here with a general overarching standard, it's flexible, and you can, you can, new, new issues can kind of come under that umbrella. Did, so, did you want me to address the class action thing? Or, or, um, it just very, 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 sorry, yeah, very, yeah, sure, very, sure. very briefly. And then um, Dana actually has a question. Great, so she's great, yeah. great. Um, uh, in in um, my, you know, this, our, our statute does not allow for private rights of action at all. So under the Federal Trade Commission Act, um, consumers don't have a private right of action. The vast majority of states have enacted a mini FTC Act, which does provide for unfair, uh, uh, that the state AG can bring actions uh, for unfair and deceptive acts and practices. Many of those state laws do allow for a private right of action, but not all of them do. And certainly uh, very few, many fewer, many, there are very few of those state laws that allow for a private right of action for unfair methods of competition. So as opposed to consumer protection, unfair methods of competition. So. Um, we don't really rub up against, we at the FTC, we don't really rub up against the class action community quite as much. Um, state AGs, I think, do a little bit more because class actions will, can be brought under those specific state laws. So. so I wanted to actually go back to some of the general privacy stuff because one of the things sure. I'm really fascinated with and struggling with is the ways in which um, we, ha we, we rely on this idea of consent. And consent is this held up as this really important thing. And at the same time, we see, and you know, I think it's interesting that you mentioned the March 1 situation with Google, because in some ways what we saw is, yeah, we saw frustration and, and upsetness, but we've also seen this moment where we've normalized systemic disempowerment. We've normalized a feeling that people feel powerless against these changes, and they end up in some ways opting out and dealing. And we've seen this with a whole variety of things. But part of what I'm really fascinated by is that in some ways, we deal with a legal narrative of consent, which kind of looks like a contract law model of it, of like, I have, I've signed off, I've checked it. But there's, I think, two other sort of key elements to consent. First, consent requires agency. And there's something really interesting when you look at um, feminist histories of this, in particular light of what it means to consent to sex, um, and what it means to understand how you can have agency and power within a very, in a situation to actually provide consent and the, the issues that play out. And of course, if we look at uh, rape laws around the world, we see these very different variations of what is required to actually guarantee consent. So this is sort of this agency element of it. The other thing I would argue is consent requires a set of literacy, right, which is the ability to understand or interpret what's going on. We see a really interesting history of this with ethics and IRBs, and I think this comes really clear with a lot of the HIPAA-related stuff. So I guess part of what I'm cha challenged by is how much, uh, you know, when we rely on consent with these questions of privacy, how do we deal with these questions of agency and literacy in a networked effects dynamic where if people don't necessarily feel, like they feel as though they go with the tide in a way where they're, they're not certain how to deal with these different dynamics? So I'm curious, as you're thinking through consent as a really powerful element, mm -hmm. how do you deal with those elements of consent? Because I think they play out differently with different groups. They, they, they certainly play out differently with different groups. Let me, um, th again, fascinate, you know, this is what you get coming to Harvard. It's like just incredibly fascinating issues being raised. I, what I'd like to do is tell you what we're doing around some consent issues because um, you're raising a lot of issues that I need to think about to tell you how I really feel about them sort of at a bigger 
grander level. But um, we, re you know, look, the, 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 the regime that we've had in the United States has been a notice and consent model where, where um, folks who are engaged in collection and use of information would create a privacy policy, they'd post it, and consumers were assumed to have read it, understood it, and, and agreed to it if they went on and used the website. Sometimes there'd even be a little check here if you agree to it, right? And if any of us, if, if any people in the room have actually read privacy policies, actually in this room, there probably are a lot of people who've actually read privacy policies, but when I go around and speak, you know, most people they roll their eyes and they say, oh my gosh, they're really, you know, you have to have a law degree, right? To really understand these privacy policies. What the regime of notice and consent has done, I think, has taken this concept of consent and made it a very legal one. And for a company thinking about how to operationalize this concept of consent, what the companies I think have done is, is they've moved, they've put this issue in their legal departments. And they've said, you know, create a privacy policy that will cover us, that will make sure that we won't get into trouble. What we're trying to do now at the Federal Trade Commission, and what I'm very supportive of, is saying we need to think of a different model of consent and of notice. Consumers can't be expected to go to Harvard Law School or Suffolk Law School or any, any law school in order to participate on the web and in order to understand what's happening to their information. We're calling for simplified notice, um, uh, layered notices, just-in-time notices, quick bits of information that then if consumers want more, they can dive down and drill down. We definitely want to see full-blown privacy policies because there's, there's a role for that. The role for that is the activist community, the people who really care about privacy, can then go in and do an analysis and can create blogs and all that about what's really happening. Very, very important. But with respect to your everyday consumer, the everyday consumer needs much simpler information. And there are a lot of companies who are getting this. I mean, if you talk to Brad Smith, general counsel of Microsoft, I think an alum from here. He's the, um He's often here, but he turns out not to be an alum. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, I know he went to he yeah. went to the college I went yes, to, uh -huh. but I didn't he know where. He went to Princeton, Columbia, I think. Oh, was it Columbia? Yeah. Oh, I think you're right. Okay, so sorry about that. But um, oh, oh, did I answer oh, your question better. already? Okay. All right, I'm sorry. Very well, well done. Well, okay. it, you know, there, there are companies who really, you know, not only believe but actually um, create systems that are designed to give consumers simpler information, just-in-time information, and simpler choices. And it really is very important. We haven't had a chance yet to talk about do not track. I don't know how many of you heard about that, but that whole concept of trying to give consumers choices through simple information and then tools that are simple, simpler, I maybe should say, to use so that they can make choices about the amount of information that's collected about them and whether it will be used for online behavioral advertising across websites. That's what Do Not Track is all about. We called on industry to do it. Back when we issued our preliminary report in December of 2010, our preliminary privacy report, and industry really stepped up to the plate. It's not perfect yet. Work needs to be done. I talk to the industry all the time about the type of work that I think they should do to make it better, but, but they're trying. They're, they're doing something. So big, big issues around choice, around notice. Um, I think it's something that, and we as the FTC generally, and me as a commissioner in particular, I think it's something we absolutely need to address. And we're trying to address it. I'm not sure we'll hit all the issues in the way that you've described them, but it's a very important issue. Excellent. Well, I think, uh, do you want to follow on or no? Um, I'm, uh, yes, sir, one, one last one. <clears throat> Um, I'm curious about, going from what she said, I want to add something. I'm curious about it. Um, how does the FTC uh, view the fact that your average individual consumer has no understanding of the technology that's, that's at play here? Um, I mean, I, I didn't go to Harvard. I went to law school, but I didn't go to Harvard. Um, but I'm a, I'm a Silicon Valley computer technician, at least by trade. And it took me forever to understand the things that Google was doing, Microsoft was doing, you know, some of the big companies, and even some of the small ones. Um, and I wrote a paper on it, and I was just kind of curious that if judges don't understand, because a lot of you judges don't understand uh, what's at play in technology here, and if uh, your average people who don't understand technology do, how, how is that going, how does that, uh, 
ring for the FTC? How, how mm -hmm. do, what's the responsibility of, of the average individual understanding right. the technology at work here? It's a great question. It's a great question. It's a great question. And you, you worded it in a, perf in a great way. Um, uh, I think it's really important to not only do what I was describing a moment ago, to give consumers simpler notice and simplified choice, but it's also important for companies to what we call build privacy <coughs> in to products and not make it so complicated for consumers, but to take on some of the burden of having to make all these decisions and, and implement privacy. We, it's, there's, a, there's a phrase for it, it's called privacy by design. And that's a phrase that was actually invented or created by a woman, um, Anne Kabukian, who is a, the Commissioner of Privacy for Ontario, a province in, obviously in Canada. Um, and she created this concept of privacy by design. And what, what, it's, what, it, what, it's, what it's getting at at its heart is to say to commercial operations, to, to businesses, you know, don't make it so hard for consumers. Um, you know, don't, uh, uh, one of the phrases that you also hear is, it's great to put things on the dashboard if they're clear and simple, but build things under the hood for consumers with respect to privacy. And there's all sorts of analogies that I like to use, like driving a car, right? We don't think every consumer needs to be a mechanic or should be a mechanic. I mean, think of what our society would be like if we all had to be mechanics in order to drive cars. It's completely inefficient. There are least cost avoiders, to use the, eco the economist's term, right? There are least cost avoiders who should build these things, build safety mechanisms and, and, and all sorts of other mechanisms that go into, car, into cars. They should be responsible for that. Consumers should just be able to turn on the key, do things like change the oil, right? Put in the right kind of gas, keep their tires filled, right? Do, do simple maintenance, but not have to know how the engine was built. In order, to, in order to drive a car. And I think that that's a really good analogy that I like to communicate to businesses to try to explain what privacy by design ought to be. They should be thinking about how they're using information, how they're collecting information, how, how much they're retaining and why. Another big element is retention of information. Um, in order to be thinking about these things on behalf of their consumers. So it's a, it's a great question. So I think each of these topics could take us for uh, hours. Absolutely. We're getting close absolutely. to our, we usually go to about 7.15. So I was hoping to bring in a few notes from the cyberspace sure. community who sure. responded to a tweet earlier. I'm going to tell you two of them. We've actually worked in many of the other ones. So thank you to everybody who emailed them in. Um, this, the first one relates in somewhat to this last gentleman's question, which um, was looking at a technological phenomenon and then asking whether it is a plausible FTC type issue. And the um, technical phenomenon, as I mentioned to you before, is called buffer bloat. And the idea that um, within networks that there are excess buffering um, instances that are probably not visible to a consumer well, in which... They're very, they're very visible. Okay. Well, how many people in the room know about buffer bloat? Okay, a couple. We've so got three, three hands went three up. Three in a very well-known um, Three in a very um, select and group. The, so, <laughs> the problem is not visible, even if the symptoms yeah. might be something that yeah. alleviated would make yeah. a big difference. Okay, so please, please take over. I'm trying to help yeah. out here. But, yeah. 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 Do you want the microphone? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Oop. Thank you. Well, it's a, a good point. I certainly can't. It's a good point. <laughs> okay. I'm, uh, I guess, what you would call a technologist. Um, so it turns out that everybody's been making the same mistake for over a decade, thinking that, that losing packets is really a bad idea, when in fact, whenever the network is congested, it is essential that they be dropped quickly for the network to to actually function correctly. So without anybody, with any, without any malice of forethought or anybody thinking about it, since memory got really cheap, we've put in buffers all over the place. Whenever the network is congested, which can happen with a single competing copy these days, um, this turns into horrible amounts of delay. So the question is, and I'm not sure I know the answer to this, um, I guess there are two facets to it. Number one, the, there's been a the marketing of, of speed has been conflated with bandwidth, and it's not. Mm -hmm. What matters for most people 
is speed is how long does it take for me to get what I want off the internet? And it's actually a way more complicated equation than just bandwidth. Okay? So there's a, a sort of truth in advertising. 10 megabits ain't equal to 10 megabits, depending upon whether there's excess buffering. So that's one aspect to it. The other of which is that is, is that that without anybody intending to, this has had the effect of, of causing um, internet service providers to end up in a preferred position for any real-time application, like VoIP or teleconferencing. Um, they, uh, without people, I, I firmly believe that this is without any malice of forethought, um, have provisioned how they do telephony services independently. So if you decide not to get telephony from your broadband carrier, um, it's not currently going to work as well as if you buy it through your ISP. This, this has interesting competitive issues. Mm -hmm. And as I said, I don't necessarily know what the answer right now for the government's role in helping this mess get fixed. And it's a pretty monumental mess, unfortunately. Um, uh, but I, so in some sense, I'm asking this question mostly to put it on your radar screen. It needs really serious thought. And, not, I, and uh, I guess there's one last aspect of this that's not been fully thought through. The whole BitTorrent net neutrality thing needs to be rewritten. The history of that is, is more complex than has been realized because mm -hmm. at the time BitTorrent deployed, buffer bloat was already everywhere and it was really clobbering the ISPs and the people trying to use the network. Okay? And it hit much harder than otherwise would because of a technical flaw that had already deployed. So a lot of people's understanding of what happened actually needs to be rethought and reset. There are people on both sides of this equation which are, aren't understanding what the other's position is correctly because they don't even understand there's been a problem. Really interesting points. I really appreciate you bringing it up. Yeah, I, I don't think I'm prepared to answer how we would address that problem today. Um, I do think that there's lots of really interesting questions that you're raising, potentially adver advertising substantiation or, or deceptive advertising issues um, to a certain extent. But all, I don't believe there's been any intentional de uh, deception here at all by anyone. Right. This is and that this isn't, is not and I, that. And, 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 and people have raised that advertising issue like around 4G. You know, they're advertising 4G, but is it really 4G? And what is 4G? And where can you actually get 4G, et cetera? Um, but I think um, from a, just to take a step back on, on all these issues, you know, obviously there's the Federal Communications Commission that, who we work with a, a lot on various issues, um, do not call. Um, we work with them a lot on um, some privacy issues as well. Uh, obviously, they have a role in, in, in many of the things that you mentioned. Um, our, our final privacy report will be coming out very soon, really soon. Um, and uh, I think that um, there'll be some discussion about what we call large platform providers. Okay, so, you know, um, ISPs, social media, um, browsers in certain circumstances, you know, large platform providers and, and, and some issues with respect to how they gather information and have the opportunity to gather information in a different way than, than others do. And it's, it's definitely an area that we need to study. I mean, it really is. Now, that's the privacy angle. You're really talking more, <coughs> I, I think, about the sort of technological functioning angle <coughs> Um, and, and uh, you know, I appreciate you raising it. We're, at this point, we're sort of thinking about how some of the, the interplay of these, these large platform providers really affects consumers and collection of information. Again, I know you're raising a different issue, so I appreciate you bringing it up. Thank you, and I'll, I'll pass along some ACM articles for your flight back on, on excellent. that technical topic. Excellent, just excellent, All right. excellent, uh, Yes, sir, we're, we're super over time, though. Do you want to, yeah. Do you mind using your mic oh, then, sorry. please? Yeah. Um, the one thing I'm going to disagree in is, um, I don't know if you call me a technologist or not, um, I, think, I think that part of it is by, by design and it's part on ignorance of, um, ignorance of the individual user because people don't understand, for example. The engineers don't understand. I think the engineers do understand. The consumers, I don't think the consumers understand. I think the engineers do understand, having worked at some telecommunications companies. I work at Motorola Mobility right now, um, and we're dealing with a lot of stuff with Google. 
I also worked as a, 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 an educational specialist dealing with SIP, talking about telecom, and they know. I just think what they're doing is a lot of them are banking on the fact that no one else does because the technology, though it has been around, a lot of people don't understand how to embrace it. They think of it as just a telephone when really there's so much behind it. Mm -hmm. And I think the only way the government can get involved, and I'm going to go back to my education background, really is proper education of what's happening. Um, I was a trainer for a long time, and one of the things I would instruct my students on is when you hear that dial tone, what's really going on. And I think when you talk about privacy, one more second, when you talk about privacy and you talk about advertising and things of that nature, I think that there has to be a component that, that deals with education, Absolutely. proper technical education Absolutely. so that no people understand that. that no question. That's just I my completely own agree. We have a big educational effort. Absolutely. I completely agree. I think it's a perfect note to end on, yes, which is you're absolutely. helping to be here as part of the educational Educa program at the Harvard Law School. Great. It's really wonderful to spend this time, and thank you for making the trip. Well, thank you. It, it was really fun. Brown. I enjoyed it a lot. Thanks, Thanks. for the dialogue.